quantifiers are right at the heart of modern logic. Phrases like everyone or someone or there exists a certain kind of thing. These are really what make modern logic the super powerful tool that it's come to be. But what are these quantifiers? How do they work? How do we understand them? Let's take a look. Hello everyone, welcome back to Attic Philosophy. This video is part of a series introducing the basic concepts of logic. In this video, we are starting to introduce first order logic or quantifier logic, the logic of quantifiers. We're going to see how adding quantifiers to logic, adding them to propositional logic, really increases the power of the logic. It allows us to capture many more arguments that are obviously valid, valid in English, but that aren't valid in propositional logic. So the quantifier is a really important, powerful tool in logic. So we're going to spend most of this video seeing how we go about adding quantifiers to logic, how they work there, and how we can use them to capture arguments that intuitively should be valid in English. OK, so why can't we just stick with propositional logic? Let's look at some arguments which are obviously good arguments, obviously valid, but which we can't capture in propositional logic. So here's one. First premise. Everyone who goes to the party is happy. Second premise. Anna goes to the party. Conclusion. So Anna is happy. OK, that's just obviously good reasoning. If everyone who goes is happy and Anna goes, then Anna's happy. But we can't make sense of that argument in propositional logic. Propositional logic deals with ands, ors, nots, if, thens, and if and only ifs. And on the face of it, there's none of those in these premises or in the conclusion, OK? This is a primitive sentence. This would be a primitive sentence. And we're actually going to see that there is an if-then hidden in here. But even so, even if we kind of write in an if-then here, the antecedent of this would be something like everyone who goes to the party. But we've got here as our second premise, Anna goes to the party. So how do we get from everyone who goes to Anna goes? That's what we would need, for an instance, of modus ponens to work here. Well, basically, we do that with understanding quantifiers. So let me briefly introduce the quantifiers. We're going to focus on two, all or every, meaning the same thing, and some, which we can also express as there are or there exist. And we're going to use a symbol for each of these. For all, we're going to use this, an upside down A. And for some, we're going to use this. So think of this as a backwards E for there exist. OK, so let's think back to the argument we started with. Everyone who goes to the party is happy. Anna goes to the party, so Anna is happy. Let's just jiggle around with that first premise a little bit. We're going to take it to mean for all people, X. If X goes to the party, then X is happy. I mean, that's a bit of a strange way of putting it. But if you think about it, it means the same thing. So now we've got that explicit if then into this premise. And we've broken it up into this part, which is something that we could capture in propositional logic, and this part, which is something that we can't. For all people x, we've got a quantifier there, for all. OK, we're going to express that premise like this. Here's our quantifier for all x. If x goes to the party, then x is happy. And we're going to express Anna goes like this. So here we've got a name for Anna, just abbreviated as A, and we're using a predicate here, goes to the party. And we write them this way around, GA for Anna goes to the party. And the conclusion we could then express like this, HA, Anna is happy. And it's going to turn out, once we've explained what the quantifier means in first order logic, that this, from this and this to this, is a valid argument. This applies to everyone, so in particular it applies to Anna. So in effect, from this we can infer that if Anna goes, then Anna's happy. And here we've got a premise saying that Anna goes, so we can conclude that Anna's happy. So we're basically doing two things there. We're doing something with a quantifier, 
and we're doing modus ponens. And it's this thing with the quantifier, universal instantiation from everyone is a certain way to Anna is that particular way. That's the thing we can't do in propositional logic, but we can do once we've added the quantifiers to first order logic. Right, so let's now go through a bit more carefully how we build up the language of first order logic. There's going to be a little bit more to it than we had in the case of propositional logic, but the nice thing is the kind of things we learn with propositional logic we can carry over here. Okay, so here are the building blocks of the language of first order logic. We've got names, A, B and C. We write these with lowercase letters, and if we needed more, we'd use C1, C2, C3. Names, or they're sometimes called constants, pick out particular things. We've got predicates. In English, these are things like is happy, or likes, or is married to. In logic, we represent these with a capital letter, FGH, or R, or S, something like that. We've also got variables, X, Y, and Z. So this is what allows us to say things like, for any old person, call them X. They're going to work in tandem with the quantifiers. And we've got two of those, for all and some, or there exists. We've also got all the connectors that we met in propositional logic. So not, and, or, if, then, and, if, and only if. We make sentences of first order logic in the first instance by writing names or variables after predicates. So predicates come in different kinds, what's called their arities. So each predicate needs a certain number of names or variables written after it to make a sentence. So a predicate in English like is happy needs one name writing after it. OK, so Anna is happy. That's a full sentence in and of itself. A predicate like is married to. You can't just say Anna is married to. That's not a full sentence. You need two names there. Anna is married to Beck. So when a predicate needs one name written after it, like this one, something like is happy, it's called a monadic predicate. When a predicate needs two names written after it, it's called a dyadic predicate or sometimes called a binary predicate. So something like is married to or likes. Or we might call this a one place predicate, a two place predicate. And we can have three place, four place, five place, any number of place predicates. But mostly when we're thinking about arguments in English, we can restrict ourselves to one place and two place predicates. In general, the number of arguments that a predicate takes is called its arity. So here we've got arity one, monadic, and here we've got arity two, dyadic or binary. OK, so when we take a predicate and we put the right number of names or variables after it, we get an atomic sentence. Atomic sentences in first order logic, these are like the P's and the Q's, the primitive sentences of propositional logic. OK, so these are the building blocks, the most basic sentences we've got in first order logic. We're going to build all the other sentences, the complex sentences from these. But just before we leave the atomic sentences, notice that it doesn't have to be a name that we put after a predicate. We can also put variables after predicates, and we can put some mix of names and variables after predicates. So long as we've got the right number, we have an atomic sentence. These ones are called open sentences. Open in the sense that they have a variable in them that hasn't been grabbed hold of by a quantifier. I'll explain what all that means in a bit. So then we can take these atomic sentences and we can combine them with the connectives just like we did in propositional logic to make complex sentences. So something like this, FA and not RAB or GX. That's, it's an open sentence, but it's a complex sentence of first order logic. We can also combine sentences with quantifiers, and we do that by writing the quantifier in the front of the sentence. OK, so something like this, for all X, FX. Um, this might mean everyone is happy. Or this one, for all Y, there is a Z such that if FY, then RYZ. These are complex sentences, OK? So sentences built up from more basic sentences. OK, so what are the formation rules, the rules that tell us what counts as a proper sentence of first order logic? To spell these out, let's use a little bit of terminology. Let's write a predicate R with a little superscript, a number as a superscript, to tell us how many 
names or variables after it, it needs to make an atomic sentence. So the sentences of first order logic, they are either atomic sentences or sentences put together using the connectives, just like we did in propositional logic, or it's a sentence with a quantifier put in front of it. Okay, these rules are recursive, so we can apply them over and over again. So we can take some atomic sentences, we can put them together with these, we can put quantifiers in front of them, we can put more quantifiers in front of them, we can combine more sentences together with the connectives, we can keep applying these rules round and round and round to build more and more complex sentences. One thing we have to get used to once we have these quantifiers in our language is how to translate from English into our logical language using the quantifiers. OK, now let's start to go into a bit more detail on what quantifiers are doing in first order sentences. So we're going to do that by looking at variable binding and quantifier scope. What do those terms mean? Let's look at it through an example, OK? Let's look at this sentence here. So this could be something like, someone is liked by everyone who's happy, or something like that. We've got two quantifiers and two variables, x and y. How do the x's and y's here in the quantifiers relate to the x's and y's here in the atomic sentences? Well, basically, that's all about variable binding. The quantifiers bind the variables in the rest of the sentence. And to show how they do that, we can draw on binding lines like this. OK, so this is showing that the Y binds that variable there and the X binds those variables there. In this example, things work slightly differently because we've got an X in this quantifier and an X in this quantifier. So here we have to pay attention to quantifier scope. The scope of this quantifier runs over this sentence until it gets to the connective, the and. And similarly, this one runs over this sentence. So even though we've got an X here and here and here and here, we treat them differently. This X is bound by this quantifier. This X is bound by this quantifier. One way to make that a bit clearer would be to put in brackets like this, showing the scope of the quantifiers. Variable binding is important because this interaction between quantifier and variable is really what determines the meaning of the sentence. What's important in this sentence is that this quantifier binds this and this quantifier binds this. The fact that it's an X that we use doesn't really matter. We could have written this second conjunct using a Y, OK? The X's and the Y's aren't important in and of themselves. What's important is the binding pattern. So, so long as we had a sentence where this quantifier binds this and this quantifier binds this, it would mean the same thing. OK, whether we express it with X's or Y's makes no difference. One final example I wanted to look at in this one, the quantifier binds this variable here. And just as in the previous case, the scope of the quantifier is just this left conjunct. So what about this variable here? OK, this variable, it's not within the scope of this quantifier, so it doesn't get bound by anything. It remains unbound. So this X here is an unbound variable. And because we've got a sentence with an unbound variable in it, it's called an open sentence. OK, so an open sentence means there's one or more unbound variables in it. If it's not an open sentence, it's a closed sentence. And that means if it's got any variables in it, they're all bound by some quantifier or other. OK, so open sentence, unbound variables, closed sentence, no unbound variables. So we're talking here about the syntax of sentences with quantifiers in them. OK, how does the quantifier part of the sentence relate syntactically to the rest of the sentence? And in particular to the variables that that quantifier is grabbing hold of in the remainder of the sentence. Let's look at how syntax trees work now that we've got quantifiers in the picture. OK, so if you don't know about syntax trees, go and look at the videos on propositional logic. We cover syntax trees there when we're talking about the language of propositional logic. All of the stuff that we learn about syntax trees for propositional logic applies to first order logic. So all we need to add really is 
how do we understand where the quantifiers fit into the picture? So let's take a sentence with some quantifiers in and let's just look at what the syntax tree looks like. So the main connective is an and, and on this side, we've got a sentence with a quantifier in it. And on this side, we've got a negated sentence. And the negated sentence is one with a quantifier in it. So we would build the syntax tree like this. So the main connective is conjunction and to its left is a quantified sentence. And we decompose that by saying there's the quantifier and there's the atomic sentence. We don't break it down any further than the atomic sentence. OK, so each node here is representing a sentence. We don't break it down any further than that. OK, so we start with FX. We add for all X to it, and that gives us that sentence there. Over on this side, we've got a negated sentence. And that negated sentence is itself a quantified sentence. And it was built up from this atomic sentence. So to build this whole sentence here, what we would do is we would start with this atomic sentence and this one. We would put the universal quantifier in front of this and the existential in front of this, put a negation in front of this, and then take both of those sentences and put them together using and to give us the whole sentence. So again, like in the case of propositional logic, this syntax tree gives us the process whereby which we build up that sentence from atomic sentences, getting more and more complex, adding quantifiers, putting it all together with connectives. OK, guys, that is it for this introduction to first order logic and quantifiers. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you are enjoying this series of videos on logic, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell icon to get updates. In the next video, we're going to be continuing with first order logic, focusing in on relations, things like liking or being married to. We're going to see what they are and how we can represent them, how we can reason about them logically. So I hope to see you back for that. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. I'll see you next time. <laughs>